Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the AFR Weekly Case Study. Uh, the EMS Division Chief, Chris Ortiz, I'm here with Dr. Kimberly Pruitt, and we are meeting with Lieutenant Tiffany Johnson from Rescue 11. Thank you for joining us today. Of course. So one of the topics we wanted to cover today was uh, an issue that's been affecting a lot of our providers and just causing some confusion. So it was good for us to be able to get us some eyes, um, talk with a provider who's actually treated some of these folks, uh, and that is with supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. So thanks for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. So go ahead and paint the picture for me. Tell me exactly what you saw in regards to this dispatch that night. Okay. So um, on this call, both Engine and Re Rescue 11 were dispatched to attend Delta um, over to one of our uh, apartment complexes in our district. Um, when we got there, um, we noticed that this was a on the bottom floor of this apartment complex. And when we walked in, uh, this young lady was on a mattress kind of in the corner of her living room um, and her the gentleman inside claimed to be her husband. He was there as well. Um, when we approached her, we asked her, you know, what was going on? And she appeared very pale and cool, uh, definitely diaphoretic, and she was anxious um, and clutching her chest. Um, she was telling us that she was having um, some chest discomfort and that she was short of breath um, and that her she felt heavy. And how old was the patient upon dispatch? What she was doing? 31 years old. Yep years young, years old. Talk us through real quick what you were thinking about on your way to that call with a 31-year-old with chest pain. Well, um, 31 years years old, that's pretty young. Um, so with her, um, I assumed maybe some anxiety. Uh, maybe she had a history of something in the past um, that we would walk into that we weren't going to be prepared for. Um, we do have some patients in our district that have some congenital um uh, diseases. So I didn't know if this is maybe one of the ones um, that we have run on for that. Um, so uh, there was a lot of different things going through my mind um, at that point with her chest pain. Excellent. So you kind of painted the picture for us already. You arrive on scene, you had her in the, the corner of the room when you walked in, she's tracking you, making contact. What did you see when you walked in the door? Um, in this apartment complex, like I said, um, she was, she was laying on the bed. She was, she was somewhat flailing around. She seemed very anxious in nature, almost restless. Um, like I said, she was pale. She was very diaphoretic. Um, her husband was leading us to her as we were maneuvering through her apartment. Um, and she was telling us, please help me. My chest hurts. Um, I can't catch my breath. Um, and like I said, very diaphoretic, very restless. Okay. And your initial impression of her ABCs, it sounds like she's talking to you, so you know her airway's okay. Yeah, she, she her airway was open. Um, like I said, she was breathing. She was very tachypnic with her breath. Um, she a appeared very anxious, um, and her skin pallor was very pale, um, like I said. But she did have a palpable pulse on her radial. Okay, excellent. And as far as the history, what did she elicit to you when you started your uh, interview of her? So I had asked her if this had ever happened to her before, because I like to find out the history of the present illness first before I move down into um, any past medical history. So I asked her if this had ever happened to her before, and she had told me that it happened a time before. And so her husband had corrected her and said, actually, this has happened to her four times before. And so I asked her at that point, you know, well, what, what was it back then? And her husband had told me that it was, she had a fast heart rate. She, they didn't know what it was called, but she had a fast heart rate. And I said, okay, um, what, what did we do at that point? And they said that EMS had come out and given her a medicine, um, and then she didn't go to the hospital. So from that point forward, I did move into her medical history and asked if she had been diagnosed with anything um, that would relate to this fast heart rate. And she said, no, she didn't have any uh, medical history. She didn't take any medications. She wasn't allergic to anything she was aware of so very interesting thank you all right so to go into your phys <clears throat> excuse me your physical exam and your vital signs that you you took initially what did you guys get and what did you see so when we first put her on the pulse ox um it showed uh, in the 200s and so i actually had the crew palpate a radial just to confirm if it was correct if it actually matched um and the pipeman at that point said that he did feel that it was correct and so i had i had asked them to put him on put her on the monitor at that point um, and continue to take an additional set of vital signs. Uh, when we put her on the monitor, she was in the 200s. I think approximately around 208 was the initial rate that we saw. Um, it looked very regular in nature. Um, and then her blood pressure, uh, initial blood pressure was 88 over 56. And um, again, tachypnic, tech um, probably anywhere between 24 and 30 breasts a minute, depending on how she was feeling at that moment uh, with the anxiety about it. And then... Um, other than that, she was satting okay. She was 98%, and um, I believe she was also hypocapnic, so she had a low capnography in 27, I believe is what it was. And then you guys uh, did a really good job. I mean, this sounds like a 
fairly sick patient, right? Her airway is intact, but you're concerned about her circulation with her being pale and sweaty. Her blood pressure is a little on the low side. You yes. did a great job quickly moving to get a 12 lead. Yes. Um, and it looks like if we review this the same way we do every time, right? You already mentioned her rate's 200. Her rhythm looked pretty regular and narrow. Yes. Right? Yep. And uh, her axis, we look at one in AVF, two thumbs up there, so good axis. Intervals looked okay. Her QT is a little bit long, which is she interesting. She did have a very prolonged QT. Yeah. Um, and so if she was nauseous, I'd be careful, like, giving her Zofran. Correct. Um, and then diffuse ST depressions, which with a rate this fast, her poor little heart's, like, running a marathon, so not surprising that there's a little bit of demand ischemia there. Um, but so I would call this a – very fast, narrow tachycardia. Um, and overall, like just kind of summarizing this patient, we have a young adult female with a profound tachycardia that looks a little on the border of stable, right? Yes. So what uh, what were you thinking in terms of like the protocol or the guideline you were going to follow in your approach to treatment here? Sure. Um, so initially, uh, when I, I first was talking with her, she was alert and oriented. Um, so I had checked off the box of mentation for her. Um, and for me, I moved her into a, a symptomatic narrow complex tachycardia um, mm -hmm. instead of an unstable. Her, her pressure was soft, um, but she was still getting palpable radial pulses and she was still mentating appropriately. And so I chose to move down more of a symptomatic um, SVT, which Excellent. is an unstable. Um, so the first things that we tried to do um, were some Valsalva maneuvers. We had her try to blow a plunger out of a syringe, um, and that was unsuccessful. We had her try it two or three different times, um, and it was unsuccessful. Um, the other thing during this time while we were having the pipe man um, keep coaching her into the syringe blowing, um, I was looking for an IV on her. Um, and I had noticed that she didn't really have too many uh, obvious proximal veins. And so I asked her at one point, you know, do you – have you gotten an IV in the past? And she said, yeah. I said, well, where, they, where do they normally do it? And she kind of looked at her hand, and I said, well, that's not going to work for today. So why didn't that work? What were, you, what were you thinking? So I needed a proximal IV, so something, you know, AC and above. I actually even considered humoral IO and possible EJ. Mm -hmm. um, those are kind of my targets uh, at that point because adenosine has such a short half-life. Good, that, so you want to um, do it as close as right, possible to the heart. Right, even okay. with that, that flush, it, we still need something closer. Super. Um, so... From that point forward, um, I noticed that in in the mix of her restlessness, I noticed that she would somewhat bear down, and I saw I was looking at a very nice um, EJ on her right side. So I decided that I was going to move forward with an EJ. Um, the big thing that I took into consideration was that she was anxious about the situation. She was very, very nervous of her symptoms, um, and then I'm over here going to try and shoot an IV in her neck, and so I knew that was going to make her even more anxious. Um, so I talked her through it. You know, I, I said, you know, listen, we need to be able to give you a medication, that same one that they gave you last time, I'm presuming. Uh, but, you know, you don't really have an IV in a site that I want to use, but you have a very nice neck vein. Um, I know it's scary, but would you mind if I at least looked at it and tried for that vein and kind of de-escalated her a little bit? And I noticed when I de-escalated her, her heart rate would come down into the 190s, um, high 180s. So that to me said, okay, we do have a, an underlying anxiety playing a little bit of a part in this too. Um, so I took that in consideration. So when I laid her on the bed to do an I, the EJ, um, in the meantime, I kind of did a two bird with one stone. Um, I figured we could try a, a, the Trendelenburg as well as in the same process kind of have her bear down to show me her EJ. So I was hitting a little bit more of a Valsalva at that point too um, with two mechanisms. Excellent. Um, right. But that was, it wasn't um, successful in terms of converting, but it was successful for me hitting her yeah. IV. So I was able to secure an EJ. Um, and then from that point forward, we moved straight to adenosine. Um, and we gave her six milligrams off the bat. In the process of doing that, we did push. Um, we had printed um, during the administration. There was no conversion at that point. There really wasn't any change in her symptoms or her hemody hemodynamic state. Um, and so we moved forward with initiating transport. Um, I elected to ride in with this ambulance crew. I had a student that day, so I thought it would be good exposure. Um, so at that point, um, we moved her into the back of the ambulance, and we, put, we drew 12 milligrams of adenosine up at that point and we pushed that and she did actually have a, a period of sinus pause she dropped um brady to 43 had that oh my chest hurts you know 
complaint. Um, and then from that point forward, she did convert back to a sinus tack of approximately 100, 110. Um, and immediately she said her symptoms were resolved. Um, she felt better. Her chest didn't feel as heavy. She could breathe again. So. Super. That's fantastic. And you were, you've already talked through kind of some of your progressions and your thought process. Where were you in terms of electricity and intervening if you needed to treat that? What was your thought process before you were able to convert uh, with the medication? Right. So um, with her, the one thing that really stood as a flag in my mind on this scene was the fact that um, her husband had told me the history that medicine had worked before. Um, so I really hug, I, I hung on to that. Um, and I figured if, if medicine worked before, it could potentially work again. Um, and with her, she was maintaining appropriate, like I said, um, her hemodynamic state was somewhat unstable, but it was, I had a feeling that if we were able to bring her heart rate down with either kind of coaching and counseling with um, the anxiety, the stress of the whole situation, uh, then we'll get better perfusion. Um, you know, lower the heart rate gives better perfusion anyway. So if we could just get her out of that that dangerous 200 level, then I could work with, you know, fluid boluses to help her come up at that point. But electricity for me, um, I like to challenge patients with the protocols um, before I jump immediately into invasive procedures, unless it's like a big, you know, you, you need to cardio over this now kind of thing, very unstable. Um, so I do like to to move down the protocol and see if I can can go that route before I just immediately um, give her electricity. And plus, she was very anxious. Um, telling her that we were going to be sending electricity through her was going to potentially make the situation worse, if not harm her and move her into that unstable. Um, and so I chose to do the route of symptomatic versus unstable. Outstanding. Sounds like it worked really good here. I was thinking there's these two trials with Valsalva maneuvers that are pretty interesting, and it's cool to hear that you did the Trendelenburg because this one um, was actually a, the revert trial was um, a randomized control trial, and it had a 43% success rate um, with people trying to move the plunger and then elevating their feet. So it sounds like you did oh, yeah. that mm -hmm. excellently. There's a new one I just read about, and I'm dying to try it. So if you get another SVT patient, you <laughs> can try this, but um, there was only 11 patients, but it had a 91% conversion rate where if you plug your nose and then try to breathe in, and it's actually kind of uncomfortable if you do it like right now, um, but it worked really well as a Valsalva maneuver before moving to your medications. And it sounds like you were totally prepared to, if she got more unstable to yes. cardiovert if needed. Absolutely. Um, well, excellent. And so this is your reassessment. This is your uh, A plus, <laughs> nice, nice uh, sinus tech uh, EKG there that you got. And then just what did you did you take away any learning points from this case that you think would be beneficial to share with? Um, I think it's important to kind of uh, pay attention to the history of the incident and also on whether or not they have a history with this sort of um, rhythm before um, and listen to them when they say, like, what treated it? Um, I don't think I again, I like to challenge patients with the protocol. So a lot of times um, people, they see the 88 over 56, they, you know, they assume she's hypotensive, we have a heart rate of 208, we have to cardio over, you know, and I think it's, it's important to really kind of take a step back, look at the big picture, um, understand that, you know, we, what, what's causing this rate, you know, are we at a reentry of 208? Or is there something else underlying that potentially could be causing her to not only have a reentry but also make that ex exacerbated um, into that 200 rate, which is causing the instability. Um, so I like to kind of just take a, a moment and and work through the protocol um, and like more step by step with these symptomatic SVT patients versus just jumping straight into electricity um, and even something simple as some boluses to kind of calm, calm the heart rate down. And yeah. Um, so, yeah. It helps the blood pressure. Yeah. That's excellent. So we do see a lot of SVT. We probably have six or seven cases a month. And it's it's fast and it's narrow and it's regular. That's a real – I always – when I'm teaching the paramedic students, I say it's pretty, right? Yeah. I always think it's a pretty rhythm. Um, but very important, we don't want to give adenosine if the QRS is wide. Um, there, it could send them into VTAC or a dangerous rhythm. And so if it's a wide QRS, even if it is fast and um, regular, I would not jump to adenosine there. And then one other thing we, we do see is that this is a young patient, and just this is just an electrical conduction problem, right? right. Um, and so we need an electrical conduction medication. Uh, 
Whereas a lot of our older patients, AFib, when it's really fast, can look a lot like SVT. But generally, I always like to step back and ask myself, is there an underlying, like you mentioned, okay. metabolic problem that's driving this that I need to correct first? Is it a fever? Is it sepsis? Is it um, ischemia or something else? Um, it's very common in our, in our elderly population that it's easy to get mixed with AFib with RVR. But It's a great point, and I liked how you took – the time to just step back and kind of just treating the patient, right? Not necessarily chasing what you see on the monitor, but taking that full 360, getting the history and then understanding before you do your courses of treatment, as opposed to just locking into that fast rhythm that we know ultimately what we can do with, but you're just not getting locked into that. So I think it's a fantastic job. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you for spending time with us today. Of sharing course. your case. Thanks. Yeah, for this is fantastic. Uh, you know, it takes the first few folks to, to volunteer to understand this isn't a scary process. I think, from a quality assurance perspective, it's the easiest for us to learn from one another if we know what's actually happening out there in the streets. So when you get a senior or seasoned lieutenant who's seen these calls and they come and talk through them, it makes people more comfortable to ask those questions and then come participate. So I truly do thank you for stepping up to help us out. Of course. Yeah. Anytime. Thank you very much. Appreciate Excellent you job. Thank you. We'll see you Excellent. next week.